Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 43 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Yes, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks, Zaki. Um, how are things with you? Things are good. Things are exciting. We're, we're now into November. For, for uh, historical context, this is November 6th, so we are uh, two days away from... Uh, uh, I, well, I don't know. You know, the the, the Cubs won the World Series uh, a couple days ago, and Biff might become president two days from now. So, so we right. really are living back to the future too. Although um, uh, we, we we should mention that by the time the uh, listeners are actually listening to the show, it, uh, we would have already been. You know, we would know the results. So this is kind of a look in the, kind of a peering into the uh, into the crystal ball, as it were, for us. But for the listeners, it'll be after. That's true. <laughs> so, so I'm 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 curious what their state of mind will be as they are listening to us. Uh, all of us looking looking forward with yeah. anticipation, well, whereas they're listening backward with you know frustration. I yeah. mean, who knows. Exactly, but, but as a historical marker, like I said, this is this is November sixth of twenty sixteen. So we are we are a few days away from the election. Uh, hasn't happened yet, but but we'll see. But regardless, uh, uh, I I can't think of a better conversation to be having in it. You know, in the midst of all this uncertainty, than with a story that I think is really uplifting, and that's I think what we're going to get from our guest today, who is Bilkis Abdul Khader. And uh, Bilkis is a Muslim American collegiate basketball player for the University of Memphis. She began playing varsity basketball in high school when she was an eighth grader and played for five years. She's notable for playing basketball, wearing a hijab. And she had a very successful high school, high school career, scoring over 3,000 points, breaking both male and female scoring records in Massachusetts. She graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in health and human performance, exercise science from the University of Memphis. And she finished up her college basketball career at Indiana State. State University, where she's currently the graduate assistant with Indiana State women's basketball team and is completing her master's degree in coaching. Thank you, Bill Hees, for joining us on Diffuse Congruence. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And and actually, just to follow up on that bio, um, I finished my master's degree. Uh, I've gra- I graduated last year, and I am currently uh, an athletic director at an Islamic school called Pleasant View. Ah, well, Men- there we go. See. Get yeah. on it, Wikipedia. Yeah, seriously, Wikipedia. I love it, but it, it, it's funny because it just stays the same. You got to step up <laughs> your game, Wiki volunteer <laughs> editor people. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, welcome to the show, Bill Case. It's it's really is a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. And um, yeah, I mean, so we um, generally we we always like to kind of uh, ask people kind of where it all began. Where, where what's your uh, origin story, as it were? Right. So um, I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. I have four sisters and three brothers, and I'm the youngest of eight. And um, my parents were, they converted early in, early in life, I would say around 23. My father may have been a little later than my mother. Um, and we were kind of a basketball family. Uh, we um, grew up just in the neighborhood. We always had basketball courts around. Um, And it was just something that I think was kind of innate for me. And I pretty much loved it from the age of four years old. So I started playing on, we called it like, we called it bitty ball. And my my parents recorded literally everything. And it would just be four-year-olds running aimlessly, chasing after like a pack it would be like a pack of wolves going for a piece of meat when it, when it, when it came to the basketball but um i don't know i think it stuck with me i just loved it and um they would say i was a tomboy i say i'm an athlete but i just, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I loved playing with boys just really any sport you know just boys were that much 
more physical, just competitive. And uh, I played basketball with boys all the way up until I was around 12 years old. That's when my Umi, she just was like, okay, things are getting, hormones start raging. Um, <laughs> things get a little awkward. So I found a girls team. I, I wasn't ready to do the switch just because it made me such, it just made me a better player, you know, playing with boys. But mm -hmm. I knew that the change was going to have to come sooner or later. And um, I was actually homeschooled. So my mother homeschooled us all. Um, wow. She just felt like the public school system wasn't, the best system as far as behavior issues and just uh, and of course just being muslim you know she didn't want us to go through that uh being different stage and the peer pressure but of course that just happens naturally in life so yeah. um she sent me to she sent me to school when i was in 8th grade and um people automatically assumed that i was going to be like uh, socially awkward or you know be the weird one but um i think basketball saved me from that part of life because I played in community centers, um, always played on a team. So I, you know, I was always a people's person. I think that was just my personality. And, uh, so I kind of fit right in. And, um, my older brother who was above me, he went to that school as a middle schooler. It was a very small charter school. It wasn't, um, we had probably less than 400 students. And, um, so it was, you know, it was a small setting still reminded me of, not exactly home, but you know, it, it was, it was a good, it was good for me to start off in. And, uh, so my brother was pretty well known for his basketball skills at the school. So then I get there as an eighth grader mm -hmm. and I tried out for the basketball team, the high school basketball team. And I made it as an eighth grader huh. and, yeah. um, it was, that's, it was, that's how it all started. Kind of. That's, that's quite <laughs> impressive. Um, now, now did you, did you try out and, like, did you make varsity as an eighth grader? Yeah, I made varsity. Yep. Wow. Was... I mean, it, that, that's a feat even as a freshman. So for you to do it as a, you know, as an eighth grader, that's amazing. Um, now, now at the, like, was the charter school through um, basketball? I mean, through through high school? I assume it was. Yeah. So it was sixth through 12th grade. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. At, in, in, in Springfield? In Springfield, Mass. Yes. Okay. Okay. That was um, really the only option I had if, if I wanted to go to a public type of school. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Now, um, uh, just, just real quick. I mean, like you mentioned, so like, uh, your parents had already, uh, accepted, like they, they, they had their own unique journeys to, to, into the faith. Um, so you were born into, as, as a Muslim, born into Islam as it were. Um, now did your parents grow up also in the, in the Massachusetts, like Western mass area or? Yes. So, okay. um, my mother, in my mother was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, moved to oh, yeah. later in life. My father was always in Springfield. It was funny. So they, um, my mother was raised a Christian. My father didn't really, I think he's, he mentioned them going to church, but his family wasn't that religious. And uh, my parents literally grew up like five minutes around the corner from each other as children. So <laughs> they were like elementary. They, they had a crush on each other in elementary school. They were like boyfriend and girlfriend in middle school. In high school, I think freshman year is when they kind of went their separate ways. So my mother had married before she met my father all over again, like in adulthood. Mm -hmm. And uh, she married, became Muslim at around 24. Uh, she found out about Islam through a man who was Muslim at the time. And um, you know, so she, she married, had two children. Uh, she was very young. That marriage didn't really, you know, work out. So she she had to try it a couple of times to to do it the right way. And uh, my father comes back around to Springfield. He kind of moved to Florida and then, you know, had his whole life journey. He comes back to Springfield, finds my mother and she's all covered. And she has around like six children. And he's like, well, what happened? You know, like he he's like totally baffled. And she's like, well, I'm Muslim now. You know, I was married um, before I, I have six children, as you can see. And, um, so she told him like, you know, now that I'm Muslim back, how we used to hang out and you know, how we dated, it, it can't be like that. You know, like I have to essentially marry someone who was Muslim. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of resonated with him in a, in a few different ways. And I think he was kind of searching for some, uh, some peace of mind in his life. And 
two months later, a couple months later, he called my mother over the phone and gave her salams. And so he had became Muslim and did his own research and figured things out. And so they ended up, they ended up uh, marrying each other not too long after she found out he became Muslim. So that love was always there, my mother said. And um, so, you know, a lot works in ways that is, just, you know, it's beautiful. It so is that, beautiful. That's them. And so that. they've been... They had me. And so I'm the only child from uh, the marriage of my mother and father. That is so beautiful. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to probably, I'm going to say something um, uh, that uh, you probably don't hear a whole lot. So I, I actually lived in Springfield for uh, about a year. So um, I'm just having a great time just listening to you talk just because I, I just want to get into like the weeds in terms of like, where'd you, you know, like, where'd you grow up? What part of Springfield? And, you know, cause uh and a lot of people uh, may not know this, or, or I, I imagine those who follow basketball do certainly. But the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame is in is in Springfield, so yeah. you were almost sort of destined, you know, <laughs> for the that sport. Now, was that around? I, I, pardon my my lack of history, but was the Hall of Fame around when you were growing up? Yes, it was, and it was actually like the best spot to be. <laughs> The Basketball Hall of Fame was always so awesome. They were like, we used to have tournament, basketball tournaments there, three-on-three -three tournaments. Um, it was very active back then, like, as far as, you know, in the community. We yeah. needed that. Now it's kind of, they kind of made it so that it was, it's hard to get into. You know, they, they, they did too much to it, I should say. You know, um, but I think they're trying to wing it back around to be a, more, you know, beneficial to the community. Right, right. And um, now, now, did you grow up? I mean, so you were in Springfield proper, not like Mountain, like not, not like Holyoke or no, some of the nearby. Literally, I live like an eight minute, seven minute drive from the Hall of Fame. So okay. I'm right in the, the this middle of, of Springfield. Right. I, we lived in a, East Longmeadow to kind of give you an idea. So more towards the Connecticut border, but right there, nonetheless. Right. In Forest Park area, so oh yeah, Forest Park, yeah, was like a bike ride away from my house. <laughs> that is so. Like my wife taught at like the White Street Elementary School, but anyway, I, I we're, we're really okay, getting into the weeds so now. Cool. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, so 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 like coming back, so you 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 uh, get into you make the varsity team as an eighth grader, um, and then uh, obviously that just sort of you know ignites an already existing fire in terms of your uh, love of the sport. Um, kind of maybe how, so how was high, I mean high school obviously as, as Zucky mentioned you were a leading scorer uh, so it wasn't just uh, that you played varsity but you were really really good at it, I guess you were you were great and so um, what I mean any particular position that you kind of grew up playing yeah so I was always the point guard um, and also well I was known as a scoring point guard so point guards usually of course uh, get other people open to get open shots and I was, I could do that and I could score the ball as well. Um, in high school, I think I was, our team was very young and our team wasn't as talented as, or skilled as, as other teams. So I kind of had to be um, jack of all trades in some of the games. Um, I was like the defender, the scorer, the, the pretty much everything. And as my team, as my team got better, we, you know, we, we won a lot of games actually for the team that we had. And um, it, it was crazy. The first game of my eighth grade career, well, high school career, which was eighth grade, I scored 43 points. And I didn't know that, you know, people recorded how many points you like took a scorebook or, or did things like that. So the next day I get to school and there's my face, like from the newspaper, it was a picture of my face in a newspaper. And I'm looking and I'm like, where is this from? Like, you know, who even took this picture? I didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> and it said that I had scored 43 points. And my first question was, well, who counted? And everybody like started laughing, my coaches and everybody. I just didn't know, you know, I was just so used to just going out and playing. Like I didn't even know that people kept stats. So in high school, that kind of changed for me because you know, that's what they have to do in order for newspaper clippings and records and things like that. So it was pretty cool. And, and after that, I think the my high school career just kind of took off. Um, I scored like a thousand points in two years. Wow. Um, so I think my freshman year, I, I had hit the thousand point mark. 
So Alhamdulillah, it was really, um, high school was really fun. Um, broke a few records and, and, and it was, it was good. It was just fun basketball at the time, you know? So, th- I mean, I, I guess the question I have is at, at what point or if, uh, was there any point where your identity as an athlete and your identity as a Muslim sort of came into collision with each other in a way that you sort of found yourself having to navigate? Yes. Yeah, so that happened my freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, eighth grade year, I was not hijabi. Yeah, I wasn't of age, so I didn't start covering um, until early freshman year. And so that's when things kind of took a turn just personally, um, just Islamically, um, identity-wise. Uh, I knew that in my, in my household, you know, as a born into Islam, but having parents who converted, like there's no cultural baggage, you know? And I say that as meaning religion was just, that was it. Everything was black and white, you know? So we believed that hijab was not an option, you know? Um, everybody and all the women in my family wore it. We did everything like by the book, if you want to say. And so I knew that once I hit puberty that, you know, I was going to have to start wearing hijab, whether I was ready for it, whether I wasn't ready for it, whatever the case may be. So that came freshman year and I was terrified to go back to school. And I remember this day like it was yesterday because um, it just, I don't know, I felt like my life kind of just came to an end. And it was, you know, I think I made it worse. I, I made it a bigger issue than what it really was. Hmm. And um, I know my mother, like, I remember her asking me, are you ready today? And I'm like, no, it took me like two weeks. I know it had to take me like two weeks to go back to school. And um, finally, uh, you know, I put it on, went into school, and I just, I didn't feel like myself. And I think back then, I wasn't mature enough to understand why hijab, you know, why a lot um, you know, why Allah demanded us to, 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 to cover or why, you know, why this was. So I wasn't mature enough to understand the beauty of it and what it represented. And so I was just thinking about being a teenager and not fitting in. But um, when I started, when basketball season came around and I started playing with it, you know, at first I was afraid of what people were going to say. But when I stepped on the court, it was like I forgot about me looking different or being different, you know, and basketball became my comfort zone. And so, you know, when people, especially Muslims, I got a lot of heat from, from Muslims, you know, just as being a Muslim woman and playing in front of men or playing a sport in front of people, you know, I got a, I got a lot of different commentary. Um, But, you know, for me, like that was my place of peace, you know, that's where I felt most comfortable with hijab. And, I used that as my, it just facilitated the process, you know, and as time went on, it was like, you know, this is me now, like this was my image and being like the, the Muslim basketball player was it for me, you know, and I I had to live up to it. And it was just like, it made it easier in a lot of different ways. And I would say that, you know, there was, I went through, there were, I got called all types of names um it was crazy i remember this one vividly i was taking the ball out of bounds and it was like the fan section was like sitting right behind me and this boy yells out you look like osama bin laden's niece Hmm. and i'm like what first of all was you know i'm like i always say i'm like such a terrible joke because who even knows what his niece looks like you know it's it's such an oddly specific insult (laughs) it was like what you know at the time of course i didn't laugh because it was just like i was so shocked to hear it the game stopped the ref stopped the game my coach wanted to like go across and rip this kid out the stands it it got really ugly and then there was like um a forum online i don't know if you've heard of masslive.com but it's like um okay so they have like a sports forum where anybody can say whatever they want about the games that night or you know pretty much opinion all their opinions and I used to go on there and read the the comments, which I probably, my mother and I should have never done. We did. We got caught up in it. Hmm. And every night was something about me after I played a game, whether or not I was taking, I was on sports enhancement drugs, um, 
I was wrapped in a tablecloth. Uh, she's she cheats. She's it was just so bad. And, you know, I had to, like, literally stop myself. Like, my father would tell us, like, just stop going on there. So, you know, people who were frustrated with how good you were doing were blaming your Muslim identity or or scapegoating that in some way. Yep. That's exactly what was going on. Wow. And um, it was tough for me. I was, you know, I was a freshman, sophomore, like, reading that type of stuff. You know, it made you question, like, wow, should I, you know, is this what people really think about me when they come see me play? And we're talking, this is like mid-2000s. Yep. It, yeah, it was, what, 2007, 2000, yeah, around there. Hmm. And um, it sucked, you know, it sucked in a lot of different ways. But I know that I love basketball so much that I wasn't going to let anything take me off the court, you know? And... um as I get through high school um, and, and get a Division One scholarship to University of Memphis, um, you know, things were just going good. You know, I would say, mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, like things were just, that was my ultimate dream was to get a Division One scholarship so that, you know, my parents wouldn't have to worry about paying for, for school. And um, I was carrying this image, of course, of still being like the first Muslim girl to play collegiate baske- basketball. Um and in a way, I think I got wrapped up in that, you okay. know, and, and it's so easy to get caught up in, I guess you want if you want to call it fame in sure. a way, you know, people knew me for that specific reason. And, um, notoriety of some level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I would say throughout my college, you know, throughout my college career, it was, it was a roller coaster ride. Um, it was, you know, the college coach that I played for was very tough on me in particular like I don't I think that she thought I was going to be like a very submissive Muslim girl and just was gonna have you know no say in anything and I was just gonna go with the flow and when you get college is a very uh it's business like when you when you're when it comes to college sports and they say what they want you they they say what you want to hear at the time of recruitment and once you finally like like okay I want to come things completely changed. And that's exactly what happened to me. And um, I get there and, you know, the people, the coach, like some of the coaches were just totally different from what I thought. And, you know, it, it was like, for example, I would leave to leave out of practice to go pray. Literally take me, what, five to 10 minutes to pray. And I would come back and my, you know, after practice, my teammates would say, wow, coach was saying how, you would leave during certain parts of practice so you can skip out on running or skip out on this certain drill. And and I'm like, well, if you, you know, we have practice almost at the same time every day. I have to pray almost at the same time every day. So the drills we do are like, you know, the same every practice. So it's just like, of course, I'm going to leave at that same drill, you know? Right. But it was like things I think, um, you know, I don't know. She just, it was, it was tough. It was a roller coaster ride. And, you know, I was ready to quit so many points in my college career to just come back home. and mm-hmm. um, Now, this is at the University of Memphis? Yes, this is at the U of M. Yeah, U of Memphis. Yeah. So, I mean, that must have been just from a, you know, uh, just from a cultural shift because, you know, having grown up in Springfield and, 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 and in Massachusetts um, and then moving to the South, um, did, did you, was there other noticeable things that, you know, that that you felt, I mean, moving from, again, Massachusetts to Tennessee? Um, I, not so much. Honestly, the people were very, not, the Southern hospitality is real. Um, <laughs> I yeah, did, yeah. It, it was, I don't know, I think I kind of blended in fine. And the thing is, when being on a sports team, you don't really get to explore too much, you know? So it was literally my schedule, my days were just, Class, basketball, training, study hall, basketball. So, like, I didn't really get to indulge in the the, the cultural change. You know, it was just um, I didn't I didn't get to view I didn't get to see too much early on. So, um, I didn't necessarily go through any type of shock. Now, family, I definitely miss my family. Um, I wasn't around as many Muslims as I was growing up. And I think that affected me in not 
in not a, in a, in a negative way. Um, you know, because the people you're around really change, start to change you, you know, you change a little bit. So, um, it, that was hard for me. Um, you know, we had local mosque around again, like we traveled so much that I didn't really have free time. And so, um, that played, I would say if anything that took a toll on me and, um, you know, it, basketball became literally my life at the time in college. Like that's how intense it was, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, I still, still held on, you know, I struggled with the college scene and, you know, of course, all the parties and things like that, having to, to not go to certain places, but of course, to, to want, wanting to go with your team and do these certain things. And so, you know, just as a Muslim girl and not having that, that, background with you you know I always had my family my cousins who are Muslim and you know you 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 find yourself shifting you know it gets harder and harder and so I learned along the way like just till now it was just like wow looking back it was definitely a struggle you know it was a struggle but um you know it's 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 and this is almost like not I mean I I mean I would love to kind of maybe Here's some of your thoughts on this, but I can't as as you're telling your story, I can't help but reflect and just kind of knowing the timeline. Um, you know, the, the the there's just so much irony here because I mean, it, had had you been born perhaps a decade earlier, and this happened pre nine eleven, um, you know, one can only imagine that you would be kind of following in the legacy of very very notable Muslim athletes. I mean, in the sense that. You know, Hakeem Olajuwon would have been a, a, a name, you know, that would have, you know, like, uh, just again, the decade you were right. born in would have been like a household name. And everyone knew about Hakeem fasting and playing the game, and, and, you know. Uh, and then, of course, not to mention, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, another great in the, in the, in the sport. Uh, again, not to mention Muhammad Ali, you know, just sort of, you know, a, a, you know our champ. So just, just a lot of, I don't know, very interesting and ironic things just based based on the fact that how much 9-11 perhaps kind of shifted the entire, you know, cultural zeitgeist when it came to Islam. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. by the time you got to high school and college. Definitely. had it. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, wow. Just fascinating. Now, um, uh, now you are, so as you said, you, you had a little bit of an adjustment, um, in, in college, uh, and then any notable sort of uh, things that happened in terms of your own basketball career uh, during your collegiate years? I, I know things do. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I think I had a, I don't, I mean, not anything to, like I said, my college career didn't really go as I planned it to go, you know, mashallah, like things happen, but um, I ended up transferring um, just to kind of find the love for the game again, because playing at the U of M, it, it kind of became a job rather than, it, it wasn't fun anymore, you know? So um, I wanted to just give myself a, a chance to find that love again. And I had one more year to do it. So my senior year, I went to Indiana State University and it was fun. You know, we actually won a regular season championship there. Um, I did end up scoring a thousand points in college, which is, you know, that's, a very cool thing to do, especially right. um, what I went through at the U of M, you know, not being able to kind of play like myself. Um, I was able to finish, get get the rest of the points at Indiana State. And um, so that was something I definitely uh, hold hold near and dear. And, um, you know, I, I finished up with, with a pretty good career and I was going to, you know, go play overseas. And that's when everything kind of happened with the FIBA situation um, and not being yeah. able to continue on because of right. it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, and I, I know you've written about this. Um, tell us maybe about FIBA for, for, for our listeners who don't know uh, what that body represents. Right. So FIBA, what I always say is FIFA, which is, you know, yeah. the Federation for Soccer in Europe. FIBA is just the basketball version. That's the easiest way to put it. And, um, You'll hear FIBA a lot during the the Olympics, like as far as when we play, Team USA plays um, for the basketball portion. And that's the league that they play in. So it's a pretty big organization and uh, over in Europe. And 
it's funny. I get, I had like an agent and an agent is the person who basically signs you on to a professional team. Um, I had a player profile. I had video footage of me playing basketball. Like everything was ready to go. And, um, I got a call from my agent and she pretty much says, well, FIBA has a rule saying that you can't wear a certain size headband or, or a certain, certain headgear. So I say, oh, okay, you know, I'm thinking that it's, oh, don't worry. You know, it's my religion. Just tell them it's for religious reasons. And you know, that's why I have to cover. And, um, once we email, this is all through email, email them back and let them know that it was for religious reasons. They write back saying, well, we want to keep the game of basketball religiously neutral. So we can't allow you to wear your headpiece. And so I'm like, excuse me. I'm like, well, if that's the case. Players who have tattoos of scriptures or crosses, you know, or tattoos of Jesus or whatever should have to cover that up because again, that represents, you know, religious freedom. And, you know, the tattoos are very huge in, in professional sports. And, you know, I think that they knew they had no luck to stand on when I responded with that reason. And they wrote back saying, well, okay, you, it's a safety hazard and you might hurt somebody yourself or another player by covering your hair. And so I'm thinking like, what, you know, like a piece of material that's literally wrapped around my own hair. You know, like I, I, it, till this day, it just, it's just not, it does not make sense, you know? And, um, I played 10 years with my hair covered and it's just like, I've never hurt myself or anybody else. And so, you know, it, it was a cop out. I, I honestly believe and still t until today, this is, you know, it doesn't make yeah. sense. How, how had this never been an issue in the past for them? Like considering they're an international body, uh, the, you were the first Muslim, or I, I should say, hi hijab observant Muslim to ever play the game that came across their desk. Yeah, so that's what I learned <sighs> along the way. Wow, that, that was it to play under the FIBA league. So there's there's a Qatari team, there's a team from Qatar who it was a Muslim team who actually right after my story kind of hit the fan, they went and made it to a FIBA a FIBA Asian game. And um, it was like a tournament that they made it to. And it fell under FIBA organization. They had to forfeit the game because they would not let them cover and play. And so it was crazy. The domino effect that my story had, all of a sudden, all of these like hijabi basketball pl players came out of the woodwork and were getting denied the same thing. And so... Um, but I was the first to want to play internationally on another team, you know, under FIBA games. And so at that point for me, I was, you know, I hit a roadblock that I thought I'd never hit. And um, in a way, it affected me in so many different ways. The identity was one of them. And it was just because I'm like, wow, hijab got me to, I met the president of the United, I met Obama. I was traveling all across uh, the United States playing basketball. I, you know, it was just like me being a hijabi basketball player got me to so many places. And then finally, when I was wanting to, to reach my dream, it I couldn't play because of hijab. You know, so it was a huge contradiction for me. And, you know, I began to question everything. You know, I began to, to, to think about, wow, should I just take it off so I can play? Um... You know, is, is Islam, like, is this a sign for me that Islam isn't for me? You know, it was just all of these crazy thoughts that I was, that I was having because, you know, I'm like, why would this happen? You know, I was questioning huh. a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, at that moment, I kind of realized that, <clears throat> that internally, you know, maybe I wasn't doing something right, you know, and, and when basketball was taken away, you know, I was this Muslim basketball player. When when basketball was taken away, I just became Muslim. Huh. You know, that was me. So I had to check myself. You know, I had to see, was I being a Muslim? Was I doing, was I, you know, was I portraying Islam the right way? You know, just, just personal. 
And, you know, I, and I don't think I was, you know, like I said before, I was so wrapped up in that image that I think I forgot who I truly was. And mm. Islam was it, you know, being Muslim was who I truly was. And I remember like, you know, I was going through all of these different thoughts. All I had to do left, all I had left was pray, you know, and I remember just praying and praying and being, you know, I being in Sujud for so long that, you know, I could feel like the blood rushing to my head type of stuff. It was just like, at that point, I needed a law, you know, and I think that was my test. And I think a law was trying to put me in this position to see, are you going to choose, you know, to take off your jab? Or are you going to, you know, ground yourself? And, um, you know, in a way, now that I think back, I'm so happy that I went through that because spiritually, you know, I became Muslim at that moment. You know, yeah, wow. I feel like, I feel like, you know, being born into Islam, you know, you're taught everything in a way where it's kind of mechanical. You know, we know to pray, we know to fast. Right. Um, you, you take a lot for granted. Take, right. You know a lot for granted and right it, it was you know i don't think i felt when i prayed did i feel it in my heart you know did i was i like i said was i wearing hijab for the right reason and i wasn't i was wearing it because one my mother i didn't want to disappoint my mother or my father you know i wanted to be perfect in their eyes but you know i wasn't doing it for the sake of a law and at that moment when i couldn't play that's when i literally I felt like at that time I became Muslim. And I say to people who are born Muslim all the time, at some point in life, you're going to go through something that's going to make you find Allah over again. You know, mm -hmm. you're going you're to actually choose Islam at that moment. And, you know, for me, I think when basketball was removed from my life, that's when Islam became the forefront and Allah became the forefront of everything. Mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm, yeah. You know, I just... I, I, so, alhamdulillah for that situation you know right we all go every, every you know born muslim or you know convert to islam you know every you know and, and i imagine this is true for other people of other faiths as well you know we all have our sort of confessional uh and testimonial moments where we have to make that decision you know and not just sort of like you said kind of go through the mechanics but actually make that you know, uh, own personal commitment to one's faith. So uh, that, that that's very very beautiful. Um, so now, any any developments going back to kind of with the FIBA story? Because I, I just find this appalling, fascinating at the same time. Just the fact that this is left, you know, that, that that they can have these rules on the board or on their books. Excuse me being that they're an international organization, um, do you know of any, uh, like, people sort of contesting their rules along these lines based on purely religious grounds? Well, um, yeah, early on, um, we, myself and another Muslim girl, well, Muslim woman who played basketball, um, we, did a, we had a petition. Uh, we had one petition when we first found out about it, which was two years ago. And then we just recently had, have uh, created another petition, which we had over 130,000 um, signatures. Uh, FIBA basically responded and said, this means pretty much nothing to us. And um, mm. there were so many times that they were supposed to meet and possibly change the rules. So what they did was, which was two years ago, they kind of, uh, what do you, what's the word? I guess, um, rewrote the rule and said, you know, we're going to allow a provisional period. Okay. They didn't rewrite it. They allowed a provisional period of hijab or, um, a Sikh, a turban for a Sikh mm -hmm. or a, a yarmulke for a Jew. They okay. said, we can play with this, um, for two years and we're going to, the team that you play for has to keep uh, track of if any injuries happen. So but what they did was they made this rule only at the national level. So I couldn't go overseas and play international, internationally with another team. I would have had to play for Team USA. So I think in a way they knew what they were doing because one, one can only play for Team USA if you've made it to the Olympics, you know? So mm. and if you make it to the Olympics, you have to be on a WNBA team or, you know, so 
I wasn't right. there. I just got out of college. You know, I didn't even, that wasn't even in my vision as mm -hmm. a whole that, you know, so they knew what they were doing by Im only implementing it only at the national level. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 and, the, and what I find fascinating in their response or this provisional idea is they were sort of double downing on this whole uh, excuse of uh, potential injury, right? Asking teams to keep records of any injuries that happen by way of people's head coverings. So you know, it's not that they were backing down on that on that on that excuse or that uh, the rationale that they were using to justify the law. Uh, or their rule, they they were kind of double doubling down on it. Exactly. Yeah, fascinating. So, now, are we still in that provisional period, or has that expired? The provisional pe period has expired. They uh -huh. were supposed to make a decision on whether or not to remove the rule back in August. Um, then <laughs> the Olympics comes around, and they say, "Oh, we'll wait until after the Olympics are done to meet up and talk about the rule." And now it's just a waiting game. Nobody's responding to um, any emails from FIBA. Um, yeah. It's just, I don't understand why it's such an issue. I don't get why. And after just the Olympics to see Ipti Hajj playing, I mean, you know, participating in the Olympics, the volleyball player in full hijab going against the... You, yeah. Did you see that picture in volleyball, which was so awesome, I thought? Yeah, yeah, it became, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, and, and even in spite of all of the, the various Muslim, notably Muslim athletes who are, who are participating in the Olympics, I, I mean, the fact that it doesn't even shift, you know, into, into FIBA's um, court, pardon the expression, right. uh, in terms of their own, like, pressure to alter their rules, I find, I just find that really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So this is where right now um, uh -huh. the latest I've heard was that they were going to make a decision in March. Um, so I have no idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, now at this point, um, uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, I know the documentary that's coming out uh, next year. The, the documentary. So um these two guys named Tim and John who work for Pixella. I think the the film the film production is called Pixella Pictura. And um they kinda just out of nowhere was were intrigued with my story and they were like, you know, we would we just want to follow you. So of course I was like, Okay, cool, it sounds cool. And um this documentary has been um very um, had a great impact in my life as well. Just Watching the trailer that they have uh, finished, and it's 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 a beautiful thing to see because I'm gonna see myself shift, you know, like see the spiritual change, um, just just so many different aspects that they that they filmed. It was it's a it's a beautiful thing, and um, so they're just going to talk about the stereotypes of Islam of Muslim women. Um, they're gonna get into uh, FIBA, of course, basketball in general. And I think that this film is, is bigger than just basketball and myself. Um, I think that it should be able to educate a lot of people who aren't Muslim and even people who are Muslim who are going through struggles themselves and trying to find that spiritual balance with dealing, you know, just everyday life and being a Muslim in these times. Um, I think that it should I hope that and pray that it'll uh, cause some, you know, just resonate with people, you know, and be a learning tool and help uh, motivate and inspire. So, mm. yeah, God willing, absolutely. Uh, now, d d just for the sake of our listeners, um, th that that documentary is called "Life Without Basketball." Um, is there a sort of a release date or a soft release date that you know of right now? Um, right now, I just know early next year. That's that's okay. all. It, that's all we know. Um, but the trailer, you can you can watch the trailer at lifewithoutbasketball.com, um, and you can just you know read. There's a summary about it in in the actual video. So yeah, um, look out for that. Um, in terms of uh, yeah, folks can check out the trailer and find out more about the movie. Um, and then uh, now, I guess to kind of maybe close this out, uh, tell us a little bit about. 
like the nonprofit that you're involved in and, and kind of what you seek to do in, in, in that effort? Well, right now it isn't a nonprofit yet, but um, okay. I plan on to get all of that done soon, inshallah. It's called Muslim Girls Hoop 2. That's, mm-hmm. That would be the name. And um, right now, without it being a nonprofit, um, I've been kind of just traveling um, around and giving motivational speeches and doing basketball clinics for right now. I'm in the mostly Islamic communities, just putting on like just trying to promote physical activity in our communities, because I think that's something as Muslims we totally lack and um, just the importance of it. And I'm doing that, of course, through basketball. And uh, inshallah, once I start this nonprofit, I hope to be able to just incorporate more than just one sport. So it's Muslim girls hoop too, but that'll be like the umbrella term, you know? And um, right now my goal is to just, our, our girls, our young women, you know, I want them to feel comfortable being a Muslim. If you want to wear hijab, be comfortable doing it and not to worry about these outside factors. Cause I know that played a part. And I think as Muslims right now, we live to impress others. You know, I think we're not living for our own sake or for a law's sake, you know, I think we're doing things to be known and to be seen. And, um, you know, we can no longer fit in, you know, I feel like it's time for us to stand out, especially in this time, um, with this presidential election and, uh, the things that are being, said about Islam, I think it's important that we take back our Islam and we take back our identity, you know, and just remember that, you know, when it's when it's time and it's all said and done and we get called up in front of Allah, you know, on a day of judgment, like we have to take responsibility and be accountable for what we did here. And we need to uh, we need to find that that path again, you know. Mm -hmm. So inshallah, that's it's what I hope to to promote through my nonprofit once I get it on the ground and, and get it going. Well, excellent, excellent, great. And then uh, you are also uh, athletic director director at a school, correct? And is that school also? Are you back in Springfield? No, that school is in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, so no, that's right. In, yep, I'm back on my college uh, stomping grounds, and yeah. uh, it's called Pleasant View School. Excellent, yeah. excellent, great, great. Uh, well, I mean, I I think that uh, I'm I'm hoping anyway that people who listen to this will will feel inspired, uh, you know, to to not feel as conflicted about sort of the public face of their Muslim identity because I mean, if there's anything you've demonstrated, it's how you can be out there, visible, uh, visibly Muslim, and and still. Uh, you know, be able to pursue your passion. So, I mean, I think that's that's a tremendous uh, the, so, something that I hope people will follow the the in the footsteps of. Inshallah. Inshallah. Well, as as we do wrap things up, I real quick, I I want to give you an opportunity to promote any any uh, online forums that you have or where, uh, places where people can reach out to you. So, um, I'm pretty much on uh, Facebook um, at my name, Bilki Sabdo Kadir. Uh, Twitter as well, and I think you can search me all with my name. Everything's my name. And um, if anybody will be at uh, Mass Ithna in Chicago, um, I will be doing the first annual basketball girls basketball three on three tournament and clinic for young for young girls. So, so uh, that would be awesome for for people to come out and sign up and play. That's great. Is Mass Ithna in December this year? Yes, December. Okay, December in Chicago, great. Um, well, wonderful. Uh, and, and any other place that people can kind of engage you or reach out to you if they have any questions or wanted to uh, find out more? Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, just as far as my my email that I give out for speaking engagements and things of that nature, um, Muslim Girls Hoop Two at Gmail dot com, and um, Inshallah, I'll be in Houston, Texas. Uh, and speaking to a few mosques and school because that's a, that's a huge Muslim community out there. So if anybody's in Houston, Texas, who are listening, I'll be there inshallah this weekend. Oh wow! They'll, okay, I'll make sure to reach out. I, I'm I'm from Houston. I, I grew up in Houston. Oh. So I'm. Uh, do you know which community or is it which mosque in particular or center is inviting you? I don't know, but they did mention that it would just be. Okay, well, I'll, I'll make sure 
I, I'll, I'll make sure my peeps in Houston find out and spread the word. Um, right. The great, great. So that's the uh, upcoming weekend then. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, well, uh, yeah. And so wonderful. And uh, I know you have a birthday coming up. Uh, so happy early birthday. Thank um, you. And when I glanced at the date. Uh, Another thing you and I have in common is our birth date, in addition to <laughs> Springfield. No yeah, I'm November 11th as well. So, uh, happy, but happy many, early many, birthday to many, many, many years before you. So. <laughs> well, happy birthday. Hey man, I got no shame. I got no shame. <laughs> I looked at the year, I looked at the four digit year that she was born, and I was like, man, I was in high school. <laughs> oh my That's all I'll say. I'm not going to say what year. No, I'm joking. Okay. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you were you were still in Pampers, uh, Bill Keys, when I was when when I graduated high school. But hey, we we, we got November 11th, so there That's you go. That matters, 11 <laughs> 11. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Keys, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. No, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, well, uh, Pervez, before we wrap things up, we do have some feedback that we've gotten and and i realize we've kind of fallen behind as far as sharing feedback uh with with the audience and, and reviews and whatnot so i figured hey let's take this opportunity to kind of catch up uh, about the show and uh, respond to emails and questions let people know that we are in fact listening to them telling us they're listening to us <laughs> <laughs> right. And considering we often end the show with people reaching out to us, uh, I feel a little remiss that we haven't. But uh, we do eventually get to them, and we are super jazzed every time we hear some some kind of feedback. Uh, generally, when it's good, um, you know, we, we keep the hate mail to yourself. So. Yeah, I, I well, every once in a while, I get I get hate mail, and I tell my wife, do, yeah. I say, I say, stop emailing me at this address. It's. I say, listen, if you have issues. It's not about the show. Um, my wife is your cousin, which makes this conversation extra awkward. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, here uh, we go. So this uh, this email is from Larry Anderson, and uh, this is in regards to episode 40 of our show. So kind of gives you a sense of how far behind we are on this. He says, hi, Zeki and Pervez. I just listened to episode 40 while driving home from work, and I wanted to take a moment to write. I'm definitely outside your target demographic being a non-Muslim, but I have a long-standing interest in Islam as well as Muslim friends, co-workers, and acquaintances, and have found the podcast to be extremely interesting and informative. The conversation in the last episode in which Pervez described his feelings about doing the Eid sacrifice himself was fascinating. I was particularly struck by his repeatedly describing the weightiness, his word, of taking a life. The contrast between the emotional impact it obviously had on him and the uninformed and ignorant voices we often hear in popular media that describe Islam as violent could not have been more stark and more telling. There was a great lesson and insight there for anyone who paid attention. I felt it expressed a great truth about uh, respect for life and God's creation that went right to the core of what Islam, as I understand it, truly is. Anyway, thank you for a great podcast, and if you keep making it, I'll keep listening. Oh, that's so nice, Larry. Um, completely floored and flattered by your email. Um and uh, yeah, I, I was uh, just yeah being vulnerable, but uh, I appreciate that that it, that it resonated with, uh, with with you and 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 like you said, uh, what the true essence of of, of this faith is. So uh, thank you for sharing that and, and saying all that. Um, and yeah, we will continue to make these. So please do continue to listen. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's always exciting and refreshing to us, at least. Uh, when we hear feedback from Muslim, uh, excuse me, from people of other faiths who listen to the show, because and and, and by the way, the 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 target de you are the target demo, Larry. Okay. Exactly, I was just about to say that. That was when Zucky and I set out to 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 start this podcast. That was our idea, right, Zucky? It was it was anybody. It it was yeah. it's it's not aimed at at uh, specifically Muslim audience. Correct. It was anybody and everybody, and and hence, I mean, you know, for those who do or I have heard enough episodes, or, you know, we try to make it a point whenever people get too much into say tech, using technical jargon or terms or too much into the weeds, as it were, to always try to get people to clarify. Just again, for the sake of our listeners who are either new to the faith or don't share the faith or anybody out there. So yeah, we make a, uh, hopefully a concerted effort to do that. So thank you, Larry. Thank you for listening. And, th and thank you for your wonderful feedback. Great. And this is from Anise Ahmed. And, uh, 
It's under the title Cavalcade of Awesomeness. <laughs> Which which was my band in high school, actually. Cavalcade of Awesomeness. Uh, Garage punk band? That yeah, Zucky was... No, no we, we did show tunes. So, <laughs> not, not a big audience in high school for that. So We got beat up a lot, is what I'm saying. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, he says, I was listening to episode 40 as I drove from Newark to Brooklyn and back yesterday on a visit to family. Highly enjoyed it. And uh, he has a few points. Uh, number one, I think it would be a great idea to do these podcasts where it's just the two of you talking to each other on occasion, especially when there are crucial events or important issues affecting American Muslims that may come up after several months. Up to you guys on the interval, of course. I'm really glad you addressed the election issues as well as the topic of ISNA. And while we hear some of your opinions when you have guests, it's really great to get the insight that both of you can provide. Because our insight is always so much more profound and better. So that's uh, what I'm saying. You. Oh wait, you're being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I'm just playing. But yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, that, that's that's pretty awesome. And, and Zucky, I know we always talk about this, but this has been kind of uh, if if one thing's been true throughout since the inception of the show is that we we are always getting feedback about doing shows with just the two of us, and yeah. so. Uh, we've only done it like twice, and and that's because you've 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 had to twist my arm. So um, it's all my fault, guys. And and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll do more of them. I, I blame Pervez for I, most things. <laughs> it's it's a safe bet. Yeah. Why not? In in my uh, life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's most what I'm people saying. say thanks, Obama. Bet. I say thanks, Pervez. <laughs> that's right. Um, and uh, well, in a couple more days, you won't have Obama to thanks any uh, to thank anymore. Well, we so, got a, we yeah. got a few months still. And that's true. I know. I know. But uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, no, thank you, Anise. And um, uh, yeah, we we're, we always love to accompany people on their on their commutes, and yes. and we do get that feedback as well. So well, and, and there's a lot of people out there listening to us in cars. Well, that's. I mean, that th that is where you're going to listen to audio stuff. Right? I know. <laughs> it's 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 the medium. Yeah. I know. I know. Uh, so this is, not, this is. I don't think we're one of those shows that people put on when they're running on the treadmill, for example. I don't. I don't, I don't know if we keep the the momentum enough for people to get in a good workout. Is, while is we're that talking. a thing? Listening to podcasts while you're exercising? I wouldn't know for since me. I don't exercise. You wouldn't know since you don't exercise, yeah. right? And I and I don't make any. Um, I, I don't make any apologies saying or rubbing that in your face, but um. But, I, actually, uh, that's not true. No. Yesterday, I walked from the couch to the door to get my pizza, and I think that counts as. <laughs> that's, that's now. Now, in, in those twenty steps, uh, if your heart rate elevated, then yeah, it uh, did. The closer the, I got to the pizza, yeah. Then you've got other, yeah. Okay, I was going to say you've got other problems if you're if you get your heart rate elevated in that short distance. But um, <laughs> is that a thing? You know, it's funny you ask. You say that because yeah, I, for at least for me, I, I might be uh, an anomaly here, but I, I remember listening to. For example, cereal. Uh, I ran. I, I I was running while listening to that. Into I as I binge heard. Well, there's cereal. a show that'll get your blood pumping, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? So, I mean... but it's it, it's it's a doozy. Um, you know, uh, I, to be honest with you, Zucky, I've I've actually been hitting the weights on uh, listening to your sister podcast, um, movie film. Oh, no, oh, cool. Okay. And, and just hearing your obnoxious like commentary and movies just get like <laughs> it gets my blood you know going enough where I can do those weights. See? That was so actually can, the could... original title of that show: Zucky's obnoxious commentary on movies. <laughs> I love that show. So uh, yeah, definitely, folks. If you're not listening to that one, check that one out as well. Oh, um, well thank so. you for that. Zucky's got his hands in many different podcast jars. Um, so it's going to get to a point where where it's going to be a competition between the number of Zucky, the, the, like the number of kids Zucky has, and the number of podcasts. It, is, is that what you're going for? Like one for each? Well, it's it's well, I'm at three so far. So I guess what? what's... Not three kids. So three, yeah, we're, we <laughs> uh, three podcasts so far. Uh, yeah. I, I, I gave birth to my most recent recent podcast earlier this year, and then my wife is giving birth to our most recent kid. Uh, in a few months, so everything. So you're, is... a, you're a few podcasts shot. A yeah, couple of podcasts well, have, g give yeah. give it a few months because I still apparently have a few extra hours in my day that I'm not uh, weeping uncontrollably. 
based on my lack of time. Um, anyway, here, point two. Anyway, we, we've digressed a little bit. Point two right. from Anis. He says, uh, I was disheartened to hear that you both thought that Isna had possibly served his purpose. Sadly, as a 34-year-old American Muslim, I have not yet attended even one Isna convention. Of course, the points you brought up regarding this, this, the streaming and other access issues, it does make sense that attendance numbers have lowered in recent years. But there is something to be said for connecting with your fellow Muslims, both of similar age and those with experience and great achievement as the community has grown. Though I, too, am an introvert, which I think you said you were, right, Zucky? I think I said that, right? You did. Yeah. Although I, 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 I dispute that self-characterization. I don't, I, don't think, I don't see you being an introvert, but oh, okay. anyway. Uh, and he says, anyways, uh, not sure I would say heartwarming, but over these 40 episodes, I certainly feel a sense of comfort when listening. It's like checking in with the two cool older brothers who haven't reached desi uncle status quite yet. Keep up the great work and inviting, fascinating, stimulating, and thought-provoking guests. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, I I love how Anis just assumes we're older brothers, man. I mean, I don't, I don't know you, Anis. I don't know how old you are, but I just said he's thirty. He's thirty-four. Oh, how do you know that? Well, he says as a thirty-four-year-old American Muslim. (laughs) Okay, got it. So, Um, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to put on my my Benedict Cumberbatch (laughs) Sherlock guys here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I missed that. Sorry, Anise. Uh But yes, I. It's uh, we are your older. So in, in my older. case, I'm a little bit older. In Pervez's case, he's extremely, extremely older. <laughs> That's right. I would be total Daisy Uncle status. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not even. It's not even would be in my Daisy, case. Daisy so. Grand Uncle status. <laughs> not yet, but I. Yeah, probably <laughs> soon. Uh, in Grand Shala. Uncle. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, thank you, Anise. Thank you for listening. And and by all means, please, I, I, I didn't, you know, um, I didn't, I'm, I'm not trying to backpedal about what I said about Isna, but um, by all means, you should definitely check it out. I think it's a great place for you to meet people, like you said, who fit your demographic, who belong to your demographic, to our demographic. And I think just engage with, the, you know, Muslims and um, it's still a great opportunity to, to do that and one that you can't do so much of, um, you know online or what have you so definitely check that out you know interesting thing about about anise yeah. he he has been a, a follower of my my mom i don't know if you know this she has a website called lessons of the day dot com uh, yes you she, she, mm-hmm. she, yeah. she posts uh, you know uh, hadiths and ayahs and qu- quotes and whatnot. so he followed that site for like forever and then completely separate from that he follows our podcast and he had no idea that she was my mom and oh he, wow! And he found oh, out. No, I, oh, so no connection. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just you know. Oh, this is a nice site, and oh, this is a nice podcast, and then who knew? <laughs> Fascinating. So uh, small, well, small world. Great. Small world. Yeah. Uh, moving on to another letter here, and this is from Talha. Who? It's a letter I need to find. Hold on. I'm gonna have to edit this. <laughs> Oh, I should have pulled it up. Sorry. That's okay. I got it. Okay, here we go. Moving on to another letter. This is from uh, Talha, and he says, uh, catching up on your amazing Muslim-American narrative catalog. He says, Assalamu alaikum, Zaki and Pervez. Over the past month and a half, Diffuse Congruence has become my favorite podcast. Wow. The conversations are so engaging, they make my long Southern California commute feel like nothing. I'm in the process of catching up on the amazing interviews. Just listen to Imam Zaid Shockers. Yes, Pervez and I share the fanboy excitement. So far from what I've heard, I wanted to make a few suggestions. Uh-oh, here we go. Uh, closing with casual slash quick questions. Too often the conversations get too deep and serious. Sometimes it's just nice to get a more personal and casual insight into the lives of the inspiring Muslim Americans. Adding two to three brief casual questions like what's your favorite vacation destination or share a quote or incident that's stuck with you from your teacher or favorite author, etc. That's actually a really good suggestion. I like that. I do too. Yeah. I do too. And I, I wish we'd have read this letter on the last couple of episodes we've that's done. That's true. So, uh, Sorry, apologies, Talha. Talha, but, Our bad. Uh, no, but we took your advice to heart. I mean, I, I think we both like love the idea of that. Thank yeah. you. 
Uh, number two, inviting some conservative mosque to influential Muslims on the show. As a somewhat conservative mosque Muslim myself, I would love to hear from someone like Yasser Khadi, Noman Ali Khan, etc., and how they are contributing to the Muslim American landscape. I'm sure you guys are learning and growing with every episode. Maybe you guys already have stuff incorporated that I'm suggesting since I'm technically over a year behind. Uh, may Allah continue to make your efforts a success. I'm definitely spreading the word about this podcast to my friends and family. By the way, I learned about your podcast from Soul Food. Great to see Muslims making good podcast content. And this is Talha Siddiqui. Well, thank you so much for that, Talha. Yeah, thank you. And uh, a, a quick shout out to my buddy uh, Amjad Tarsin over at Soul Food. Um, uh, Amjad is the uh, chaplain at the University of Toronto, and that's their podcast, Soul Food. And uh, Amjad, another one of those uh, supporters and fans who've been listening to this show since the very beginning. So thank you, Amjad, for that and for recruiting recruiter, uh, listeners for us, listeners like Thalha. And uh, thank you, Thalha, again, for your, like like we said, uh, for your feedback. Uh, I, I like the idea. I like the suggestions. Um, and with regards to the idea of having guests on who are quote-unquote conservative or moss types, um, you know, I, I don't think... Zaki and I, I, I can speak for Zaki when I say this, that, I mean, neither of us uh, intentionally have not reached out to those type of people, but it's just that uh, it's a matter of scheduling. Um, uh, we'd love to have Yasser on the show. We'd love to have Noman Ali Khan on the show, but, I mean, they're extremely busy. Uh, but uh, I do have that personal connection of having known Yasser uh, during our undergraduate days, so maybe I'll leverage that one of these days and uh, – twist his arm enough to have him on the show but uh it's definitely not a not intentional on our part to 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 miss out any or miss out any voice or point of view from the show that is true and uh we also have one review up on itunes that i wanted to share and this is from saeed saleh I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not an American, but a Turkish Muslim PhD student at an American university. I love your episodes with Muslim scholars such as Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah and Professor Sherman Jackson. For young aspiring scholars, it's great to hear their experiences in Islamic studies. It helps to contextualize their work and makes it more enjoyable and meaningful to read. It also serves as an example for us how to live a purposeful and meaningful life. Keep up your great work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, we hope you enjoyed our, uh, the last episode, then, in that case, uh, with uh, Jack, with uh, Professor Jonathan Brown. So that was right up your alley as well in terms of uh, Islamic studies professors. Um, and uh, go back, and we've got some episodes with uh, Dr. Munir Fareed, also in that vein, uh, Ingrid Matson, who, again, you know, uh, condolences, uh, who, who lost her daughter recently, and we posted about that on our Facebook page. Um, they have a charity. She has a charity for her in her daughter's name uh, that goes for building wells because her daughter's love of water. So we'll definitely go ahead and make a make a link. I want I've been meaning to post a link to her charity. So um, again, our um, our heart goes out to Dr. Matson and her family, um, and uh, Dr. Ibrahim Musa, who is another past guest who would fit that vein. So definitely check out those episodes. Well, there we go. And I think that's a good place to leave this conversation. We'll be back very shortly with uh, another episode and a special guest. I think that you will enjoy hearing that. But let's wrap things up there. On behalf of Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan. And if you have any emails or anything you want to send us, go ahead and email diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Also hit like on our Facebook page. And, uh, and our Facebook, it's facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. And of course, leave a review on iTunes, leave a star rating, every little bit helps. And with that, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time.